the sister of Lynn Shelton. In the front row, first question today. So the question was, uh, between an improvised script and, uh, and working with the script word for word, how were you able to create uh, a comfortable environment for them to work with? Um, okay, so let's see, this is my fourth feature, and my first feature was, was made in a traditional way where I wrote a script and then cast the actors and we made it, and um, I found it a little bit frustrating because uh, all the time was spent on the lighting and so much, so little time was spent on the acting, and I got the naturalism I wanted, but it just always was such a struggle, and so I had this idea that maybe I could make a really actor-centered, performance-centered set and scale the crew way back and uh, maybe even, you know, most of the lighting equipment and make it all about making the actors feel really emotionally safe and really comfortable. Um, and uh, so they just be really at ease and be able to be themselves almost, you know, or, or bring themselves to the performance. And then I also thought that maybe if we <clears throat> developed the characters together, you know, in a sort of collaboration, um, that might really be great too because then we could build up all this backstory and um, the, the, the actors would really know who they were and who, what their relationships were with the other characters. And, uh, and then the last piece to that puzzle was improvisation. And, um, and so with Hump Day, my last film, which is my third film, I, um, I started it with my first film. I mean, my second film, I thought was brilliant, so I tried this as an experiment, and then I keep evolving the, the process. And with Hump Day, we had a 10-page outline. And that was all. We had no script. We just had a description of what was going to happen in each scene. And, and the emotional milestones that we had to meet. You know? So it was very structured. You know, it wasn't like we just showed up on set and said, okay, what are we gonna do today? You know? um, we really knew what we were gonna do, but um, in, in terms of the actual word spoken, that was all gonna be coming out of the actors' mouths. Um, and with this movie, I had, I had really veteran improvisers in that movie, so I felt comfortable doing that. With this movie, um, the actresses hadn't had as much experience improvising. Mark Duplass has had a lot of experience improvising, but um, to put them at ease, uh, I made more, I wrote some dialogue. So it was a 70 page kind of script mint. Um, kind of half, some of the scenes were more sketchy and some of them were really written out. And, and they have to be able to feel like they can fall on their face in order to take the risk to go ahead and improvise. So um, for, a, for a five minute long scene, we'll probably shoot a 20 minute take and then editor Nat Sanders and I will just like in the edit room carve out, you know, take out all those sections that feel like you're watching paint dry or, you know, they aren't working or, and, um, and just find the little gems and, and stick them up for you guys. So that, the final script is actually written in the edit room. Did that answer your question? No. Okay. <laughs> yes, the woman in the white standing up, I love it. Can you please comment on the composer and the music? Well, I have this family, um, I call it my second family, because um, <laughs> I have a real family too, but my second family of collaborators in Seattle, Washington, where I've been making all my movies, um, this is my fourth, and um, I've worked with a lot of the same people, and especially my director of photography, Benjamin Kosolke, um, who actually works also closely with Guy Madden, one of your um, country's own. Um, he just shot Keyhole, which showed last, last weekend, and. Uh, and Vinnie Smith, who is my sound designer, and he's, he's really an incredible, incredible um, talent. He, he's the production, he's the guy who holds the boom pole, he does all the production sound um, on set, and then I give him, then he does all of the sound design and the um, ADR, I mean, everything, the sound mixing, he does it all. And then he started the last, the last movie, he started doing music, because that was where he'd begun in, in his life as, as a musician, so he asked if he could do the music for Hump Day, and I said yes, and that worked out great. There was much more music here, and really there's this, if the music hadn't worked in this movie, I don't think it, the movie would have worked. And there's this one section that's about six and a half, seven minutes long, that's when the girls are, start trying to get back together, and you know, um, less tense and more friendly. And, and he's on this vision quest, Jack is on his vision quest on the bike, his crazy vision quest to nowhere. Um, and that whole section is a really long section, and there's no dialogue. There's like an I'm sorry and I made you some potatoes, you know, and that's it. And, uh, and it's otherwise it's just sound and, and, um, and, and uh, it's sound and vision, but it's also, we have to hold two different emotional arcs that are going on. And so it was, it was just, I, I was terrified. We were trying to find temporary music when we were editing 
It was so hard. And so I, I'm, yeah, I'm, it's my favorite part of the movie now. And, I'm, and so I'm very, very grateful to Vinny for um, doing such a great job. But he's, it's nice to have collaborators that you can kind of all grow together and give them opportunities to grow and expand, you know, and, uh, and push them to, to do even more. So. Next question. Sir, right in there, I see you. Beautiful. For, for my last film, I used a 10 page script, but this was like a 70 page science script. So that sounds like a multi part question in terms of the, the process of the scriptment to funding for the script. Yeah, where does the phase come um, from? Well, uh, okay, so one of the questions was where do I get my development funds? And um, the, the answer to that is IFC just gave me my development funds retroactively by buying this film. Um, because we all worked for very little or nothing, including myself. Um, but we worked for points. Like everybody who worked in this movie has a piece of, of, of it, has a, has a you know percentage. And so they're not really making pure profit at this point. We're we're actually getting we're actually paying them <laughs> for their work. If that makes sense. Um, so it's a model that is it's limiting because you have very few resources. You have to be doing other things to make money while you're developing the film and while you're making the film and editing the film, but um, it's very empowering because you get to green light yourself, you know, instead of waiting for somebody else to give you permission to make a movie. I mean, I specifically wrote this movie so that it would be affordable to do. Most of it takes place in one location, and you know, we were all able to sort of live as a small crew. It, it, it took about 12 days to shoot. Um, that really, really helps a lot because, you know, just fewer days, the better. So, you know, and you can get something like the Millie Blood, who's not doing it for the money, but is doing it for the life experience, and you're not saying, come, you know, spend four months with me to do this fun thing. You're saying two weeks, you know, two weeks of your life, you know, and she's like, yeah, sure, you know, why not? So all of those things really help to make it, um, to put it together. And there are, again, there are limitations. There's only certain kinds of stories you can do in this way. But it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly empowering to not sit around and wait for development funding, you know, money to come in and stuff. Um, and then just one more thing, your question about which came first, did I have the script and then go out and find the actors? No, I pitched the actors. Um, actually, Mark pitched me, because we'd had such fun working on Hump Day together. He came to me and said, hey, my brother Jay and I, they're also um, uh, filmmakers, the Duplass brothers, have this movie that we're never gonna make. It's an idea that we had a long time ago. We're never gonna make it because it's about a guy and his dead brother, and I think it's just too close for us, you know? And so the very, I, the very beginning was what he had. Um, it was just a guy having a hard time getting over the recent death of his brother. Best friend is a beautiful gal, but you know, they're platonic. And then she sends him up to their family place. And originally it was going to be that, that the unexpected guest up there already was going to be her mom. Um, and so I ended up shifting that to an older sister, and, uh, and we went from there. But that was really the very beginning of the movie. And then I, I had a relationship with Emily's um, agent, I'm not a relationship relationship, but we're friendly. And he, and he really, really liked, he was a big fan of Hump Day and my earlier work and me as a director. And so he really was great, he was a great advocate um, and, uh, and said, you should really talk to this woman, I think you'd enjoy working with her. And so we talked for like 20 minutes and she said, yes, it was great, it was wonderful. And, and then at that point, you know, most people write the script and find the actor to fit the characters they thought of in their head. What's great about this is that um, I'm, I'm asking the actors to be a part of that process where they get to develop their own characters. So I just have that kernel of an idea when I come to them, and then as we get to know who the characters are, I can figure out how they're going to behave, you know, believably in every scene, and it kind of adds up. So it's sort of an upside down, you know, mixed up way of making order, of making a, a, a script, but it works for this particular style. Talking like a maniac. Right in the back. <laughs> the question was, do we shoot chronologically? And I've always tried to shoot chronologically with the style. With Humpty, we were able to shoot completely in chronological order. It was really, really, really helpful to make an adjustment. Um, if, if something happened in the previous scene that we just shot, you know, and, and it felt like, it, you know, we need to change the script. It looked like it was going to be good on paper, but this just isn't quite working. We need to adjust it. We could then make, you know, it ripple through if we needed to, so the next scene and the next scene could be adjusted. Unfortunately, with this movie, we couldn't because Rosemary DeWitt got into the process rather late. She actually stepped into the shoes of another actor and had to leave for scheduling reasons at the last minute. And so, in order to work with her, we had to fly her back and forth twice to LA from this little remote island that we were on. Um, and she was still on United States of Terra in production of United States of Terra. So that poor woman never, I don't think she slept at all. Um, she was always working every day, either on our set or their set. 
and was just such a trooper. She was incredible. But we had to sort of switch things around. We lost a couple days of shooting because we had a really hard out, and we also had to switch things around a little bit. And it was a good lesson for me. I realized that actually it's, um, you know, there's some times there are advantages to shooting out of order. It's, it's usually, it's really nice to be able to shoot in order if you can, but um, for instance, those first two scenes of the movie, the funeral, you know, sort of commemorative ceremony, and then the um, little party, and then the hallway scene where you get to know Jack and Iris for the first time, those were shot very end of the, of the process. And that was great because by then they really were like kind of best friends. <laughs> um, Mark and Emily just got along famously. So that chemistry was really palpable you know, between them. So sometimes it's, it's okay to shoot out of order. It's really fun if you can do it. But. So the two questions were this film has a theatrical feeling and what was the camera setup like for the shooting? Um, so I have not thought of making it into a stage play, no. but. Um, it's interesting, Hump Day was actually optioned by uh, an Italian playwright who wanted to turn it into a play, which is really interesting. Um, and it's similar, it's like a lot of people talking in rooms, you know, so yeah, I can see how you can stick it, <laughs> stick it up on the stage. There's also a French large budget movie being made, remake out of Hump Day, and I don't know if anybody, if that's ever happened before, an independent film from this, you know, this continent going over there, anyway, really a little side note. Um, the improvisational, uh, um, yes, when we're working with improv, I, not everybody does this, uh, the directors I know who like to work with improv, but I really like to work with two cameras. So it's basically, there's usually always two cameras, um, unless the room is too tiny or there's some other reason not to. But um, like, for instance, there are quite a few just two shots where I let things just play out in a two shot or one shots. But when there's conversations and it's just really, you know, going, um, I always like to have two cameras so the, cam the actors never have to completely totally repeat everything they just said. You know, that's the whole beauty. And you're right, the freedom. When um, the Bush story, famous Bush story, you're actually seeing Emily really for real, like just be completely, she's crying with laughter and mortification and she's flushing bright red in, in real life um, because she didn't know Rose was gonna say that. And that's exactly, <laughs> you're looking for a way to make the tension rise, you know, and, and we were talking and talking, trying different things, and then Rose was like, I got an idea. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is, let's just roll the cameras, you know. And that's the kind of thing you can do, and it's a purely spontaneous moment, which is the beauty. It's really stressful to write on set, but it's also, you get moments like that, which can make it all work well. So unfortunately, we have time for one more question. So who has the best question in your audience? <laughs> no question. Miss right there, you've got a nice smile. Let's go with you. <laughs> That's a great question. Let me see if I can rephrase that. <laughs> in, in what manner do you introduce the characters in terms of stylic, stylistic elements and themes throughout the film? And she was specifically asked about, or praised, the way that I introduced Jack's character in the Sorry, first scene. Sorry, that part. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, leave it out the best part. Um, and you also mentioned the Pat Tillman story, which is really incredible, because that was actually an inspiration for us. That there's a documentary called The Pat Tillman Story, and there is this amazing scene where his brother gets up at the funeral, and, uh, and he kind of does something similar to that. I mean, it's not really, but it's the same idea, that all of a sudden, it's like you said, truth to power. It's like, you know, um, it's, yeah. I mean, here's the thing about, I mean, just this thing about that scene that I've been thinking about a lot is that I'm hoping that the audience will love the characters and sort of accept the, the characters in this film the way that Jack accepts his brother for all of his flaws and all of his humanity, you know, and not just the good parts, but the bad parts and the, you know, I mean, that's what makes us human. And then I realized, you know, I'm getting really woo-woo here, but <laughs> if we recognize ourselves in them and their fallibility, you know, and, and I can see our own fallibility, we can, if we can forgive them, we can sort of forgive ourselves. And I don't know, there's just this thing I've been thinking a lot about how we're all flawed, we're all cracked vessels, believe me.